Uh, yeah, so welcome everybody. It's um, thanks for having me. I should say first thanks Diane and thanks to the whole team um, and the School of Tourism and, and um, Hospitality here at UJ. Uh, it is a school of hospitality amongst other things and the hospitality I've received here is uh, it's been phenomenal. Um, it goes back to contact uh, I have with uh, Professor Rogerson. Um, one of the aspects of the hospitality I enjoyed actually yesterday uh, with um, a fabulous dinner I had with the, uh, prepared by the hospitality uh, school, some of the chefs there and like, an excellent service, excellent dinner, really enjoyed myself. So you're having a great setup here and I'm really glad to be here. Um, it, is, uh, it is something I'd like to put ahead um, when, I, um, when I come enough, as Diane was saying, I had uh, several different uh, fieldwork locations in my work and um, it always feels a bit like that I come here and actually don't know very much and don't understand very much. So I'm very depending on the insights that people I meet here share with me, that, uh, that the knowledge that is here in place. Um, and and um, I hope we have a bit of a chance to do that today as well, like after the presentation, maybe through questions and remarks that you have. And of course, you'll find my email address if you have things you can't say here. Um, uh, please, please do get in touch with ideas, with, uh, um, with questions, with critique. So, what I want to talk about today is um, a concept of uh, tourist valorization and um, I'll make that concept, hopefully I'll make that concept a bit clearer by discussing uh, discussing different case studies, in particular focus on a case study from uh, Rio de Janeiro um, where I looked at a favela uh, in um, neighborhood and favelas are um, low-income uh, neighborhoods, slum neighborhoods in, uh, in Brazil, they're called that in Brazil and there's differences and similarities to these places across the world, I'll come to this. So with the example, I'll talk about the concept of tourist valorization that I try to employ there. I'll also uh, talk about what I call local value regimes, which play an important role in a phenomenon that I think speaks through slum tourism, and that's disruptive tourism, or just dis disruptive valorization of tourism. I then dwell a little bit on um, tourist valorization in um, regards of uh, tourism and, and uh, urban policy in particular. Um, and as I said, hopefully uh, make this all uh, illustrative by, by telling you the story of this amazing uh, favela complex Olemao in uh, Rio de Janeiro mainly, but then I'll also do a few um, sort of ideas and observations, uh, um, spin them in from, from my recent uh, visit here in Johannesburg of different, taking part in different tours and also talking to some people. Now, just to introduce this a bit, slum tourism research. Um, what's in a name? What is a slum? And what is tourism, in fact? You know, these are, these are questions that are, of course, pertinent. A slum is a very bad word. It has, a, it has lots of negative associations. Across the world, neighbor, low-income neighborhoods have different names and, and have very different characteristics. Um, often, um, you know, they're referred to, as I said, favelas. Um, when, you, when you talk about townships here, uh, it's very, very hard to, to associate that with certain uh, slum areas, for example, in India. Like, it's, it's not at all the same thing. So it's important to keep this in mind, there's a, there's a big variety there. Tourism as well. We have our ideas of what tourism is, and, um, and often, um, often these are very narrow. We think of particular uh, people who are tourists, we think of particular uh, purposes of the, of the trip, uh, maybe related to, to leisure and fun. Um, again, it's important to, I think, expand the ideas of what we understand as tourism, something that you're all aware of because you also work in this field. Then, of course, the important issue of moralities. And um, that's where kind of our preconceptions of slum and our preconceptions of tourism really clash. And this is why this topic is extremely um, uh, extremely uh, yeah, sexy, you said, uh, you could say that, it's, it's causing controversies. There's always, uh, there's always a, a question of like, you know, is it okay, is it not voyeurist, is it not um, degrading, uh, if like people who just engage in leisure and just want to have a good time and fun, uh, 
EIA tourists are looking at people who are, according to like the prominent definitions of slum, are living in misery, squalor, are sad and um, and and um, and uh, in need of help. It is important, I think, of course, important for us in, uh, as researchers to move beyond those simple moralities. And the moralities in slum tourism normally play out in a very straightforward sense. On the one hand, you have sort of the, the critique, which says uh, it's immoral, it's voyeurist, venture-seeking. On the other hand, you have a very simplistic reading of tourism as potential source of income, you know, where through tourism you can make some money and it can create some entrepreneurship in areas, this is, I say this is, uh, this is a narrow view. Of course, in itself it is very important, but it's also a narrow view of tourism in the sense that um, tourism is much more than an industry potentially, it can have some uh, much, more, much more impact. So the moral debate between is it a good thing because it maybe creates some business um, in, in poor neighborhoods or is it a bad thing because it's voyeuristic um, is, is limited in, sev in several ways. Um, quick, uh, quick notion as well of the sort of uh, the character of it as an industry, its size, does it actually matter, is it just a, you know, a sexy topic that is very marginal. If you look at the size of the phenomenon across, across the globe, I mean, it's maybe the most important argument against the, uh, a reading that's too much focused on the economics of it. It isn't that many people, it isn't that much money that is being turned over there to be in any way a solution to uh, uh, the vast uh, problems of inequality and, and, and poverty we face. So again, this, this uh, uh, solely focus on, um, on economic matters would be to uh, to narrow, to actually even um, yield the positive effects that it might have. So instead, let's look at what actually goes on. Let's look a little bit deeper and um, and look at the, at the processes that can happen and how can we read it beyond um, beyond this moral debate. And and in order to do this, I uh, I'll um, I suggest and I'll work with this idea of tourist valorization. Now, what does valorization mean? It's of course related to the word value. So the question is, how does a place become attractive? And that's in a very general sense, not just an attraction, but how does a place become attractive? And the most basic idea, of course, is that it's considered valuable by any number of people. Now, different places are valuable for different people for different reasons. So it's a complex situation. Valuation is always complex. It's often conflicting value judgments, ideas of why a place is, is, is good for me, why I like it. Um, it, it is very, very pro. Now, in, um, in um, contrast to this plurality of values that people see in a place, we have a singular notions or singular notions, powerful notions of value. Value in particular as economic value, something that how, how multiple values are, are converged into one value that is usually um, through, um, through ideas of real estate value, actually, when you talk about places, particular city places. Now, this conflation of several values into one value is very problematic for several reasons. But these are really important structural factors. The real estate market plays a role in this, an important role in this, but also the state. The state with having the power to define places as valuable. For example, if you think of any attraction, um, as the state puts, an, puts a marker on it and says, this is a valuable place, this is also like a structural factor in, in, in sort of um, reducing the complexity of all the conflicting values. Um, from this idea um, to go to local value regimes is the idea that sometimes through state and through real estate market um, and also through more cultural factors we have rigidities in, um, in, this value, in, in the value uh, imposition. So a value of a place is not just as plural as it might be if you ask all the people who are actually taking part in it but it appears to be uh, one place is very valuable another place is not very valuable because it is been so defined through political economy, through, um, through other structural, uh, structural factors, and also um, issues like habitus. And, uh, these uh, value regimes, uh, regimes are important because they can tend to be, um, um, they, they turn out spatially in, in regards of place, but they're also sticky. And by sticky, I mean that they kind of linger on, they're powerful, they, they remain in place even, even uh, long times after. Uh, after real changes have taken place in a place, and it's still the value regime is still in place. Um, instead of focusing on those structural factors, and they are really important, of course, to consider, I like to think of valorization as something where we have a primacy of agency. That is, 
we, we should really look at how people make places valuable first. And, um, and the primacy of agency means that people are the, the prime drivers of in, their, in, in making places valuable, of, make, of, of, of making this happen. And the structural factors often lag behind, they're sticky. The local variety might not quite be there yet. It has, it has not caught up with this. The structural factors come second. So in this theoretical fr framework, the question is, what is the role of tourists? Um, and my argument is that tourist and tourism can be considered a key factor in the valorization of places. And that's, of course, acknowledged. Then, for example, David Harvey um, talks about the art of rent, where tourists, according to his analysis, follow the gentrification of places. They then allow real estate to extract more rent in an already gentrified neighborhood or city. But I think this view on tourism is too limited. It's often shared by policymakers, actually. They put tourism sort of afterwards. Tur like you have a valorization of a place, and then tourism comes and allows you to cash in on it. I think uh, it's important to see tourists themselves as valorizing agents. Um, and this aligns with uh, certain ideas in tourism studies. Um, one of them is, uh, is often referred to as the creative turn. Um, the idea that tourists are co-creators of attraction, destinations, tourism demand. And you can think of the example of lifestyle entrepreneurs, people who really like a certain activity, they really value a certain beach because they can perfectly surf there. And they never, they're never meant to start a tourism business, but because they really like to be there, and they have friends who also like to go there, they might get the idea of starting a bed and breakfast there, because it is, for them, uh, the ability to, to be there all the time, it, it creates this. But the main purpose of the bed and breakfast is not to have a business, but it is to enable them to live in the place they like to live. Other examples of this um, co-creation is of course word of mouth and electronic word of mouth, super important now, social media examples. The way that tourists are making attractions through formats like TripAdvisor helping advertise places and so forth. So, in this sense, some people suggest that we can understand tourists as part of the creative class, a concept that's very controversial and, again, a bit sexy and uh, kind of out in the media, but also very limited. The idea that they are part of, of um, um, the idea of the creative class is problematic because it's a very limited view on who's actually doing this, as if there was like, some people who are, by definition, more creative than others. I think it's important to keep in mind that, of course, everyone is creative and everyone takes part in this. Um, but also the question would be, how do tourists specifically contribute? And I think um, it's important to think here of the idiocy of tourists. Of, and by, I mean by that something actually quite sympathetic of not knowing a place, of not knowing the rules of a place, of not understanding the spatial, the value regimes that are in place, of, of just having no idea. And that enables them to be, uh, to do this disruptive valorization. So let's try to look at this, at the example of Brazilian, a Brazilian, the Brazilian favela, the favela seta. What is the value of a favela? What is the value of a slum? It's first important to keep in mind that slums in general, and Brazilian favelas as well in particular, are valuable for the people who live there, because they allow them to live in a city where they find work, um, to have um, housing, to have a uh, social context, variety of reasons, cheap housing, access to the city that is otherwise difficult to attain. So, so that's of course the fundamental uh, there. But then there's also like a more problematic value, maybe, or more uh, the way that value regimes are built into the, to the political economy of a place. This is a map of Rio de Janeiro. I come back to this, but just to give you an idea, um, you can see here the, the, uh, the big background picture, the broader area of Rio de Janeiro, the broader municipality, and then the sort of smaller circle, the south one, which is the main tourist, but also the, the richest part of the city. Now, Brazilian favelas are spatially often some of them are directly located next to the richest part of the city, the south zone, which you, which you see there on the bottom. So um, the, why are the favelas so close to the, to the rich part of the city? What is the, what is the deal there? Well, it's partly to do with physical geography. There's these mountain ranges there which were hard to settle on and they're kind of prone to um, mudslides and it's difficult to build on them. So in the initial settlement of, um, of Rio de Janeiro, these were, these were just kept empty. And as um, as migration was happening into the city, 
these, uh, these hills became a place where people who didn't have a lot of money could actually settle and build their houses. Uh, why was it convenient that they settled there? Because they were right next to the places where they had work. That was the, play, the expanding formal city housing. The, the men were, were mainly employed in housing, in building uh, industries, and the women were mainly employed uh, as, uh, as um, uh, domestic uh, workers. So, so it was good for them also to be close to it. Now this, this brings us to, the, in the, to some of the, the uses of the local value regime in a political economy of a place. The favela is such an important part of, of the Brazilian city and yet it's a, it's a highly stigmatized place. So uh, residents in a favela may be actually quite rich, but they still remain considered uh, favelado, which is a very negative term and means someone coming from a favela. This spatialized local value regime has certain functions. It has, uh, in the first instance, it's about uh, an understanding of favelados in, in that negative sense as second-class citizens. They come to the city, but they're not really considered part um, full citizens in the same way. So they're not genji, which is uh, just a way of saying um, um, a human being, but kind of uh, almost like gentlemen in English. And also, this comes with a certain invisibility. So uh, these areas are normally blanked out. There's a, there's a whole history of like Google Maps naming and not naming favelas. Because in Brazilian, uh, traditional Brazilian maps of, uh, of, of, of bigger cities, Rio de Janeiro as well, the favelas would just not be marked. They would, were not there. I and mean, Google, Google Maps actually started to mark them, sometimes causing controversy because suddenly Rio de Janeiro looked like it was all covered in favelas, which in fact is. Um, mm -hmm. But it wasn't, it wasn't going to down too well with the people in the city administration. This has changed now, it says, I'll come to this later. But what is the, what is the purpose of this invisibility, of this, of this important labor of these people who live in a city but they're not fully there, they're not considered fully there? The purpose, of course, is to keep their labor cheap. Now, when I say purpose, it's not that there's any individual rich person in, in, um, in Rio de Janeiro saying, oh, I'm not seeing you, so to keep your labor cheap. It's a structural factor. It's something that is built into the, into the logic. And you have that, it's actually quite parallel. Uh, rural to urban migration tends to create um, 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 slums, and the people who arrive new in the city will initially be overlooked. They will be kind of invisible. Um, often it's even also represented in the immigration status, for example. You know, they'll not be actually fully recognized as citizens because they are foreigners. They come from somewhere else, something that's more applicable uh, in, in Europe uh, as, as well as in the US as well as here, actually. So it's a cheap precarious labor uh, reserve. The function of the local value regime then is to, um, to keep um, through indivisibility, through not allowing full citizen status to the, to the people who live in these places, to keep the labor effectively cheap. Now in all this setup, looking back at the map briefly, in all this setup of Rio de Janeiro, you have like this more or less invisible parts of the city uh, where, the, where much of the labor of the city comes from, and you have the rich part of the city. Now we have enter the tourists. Tourists are coming in to Rio de Janeiro, of course, for a long time already. It's a famous tourist destination. Um, the, and, and the tourist valorization of the favela uh, is probably going on for a very long time, in a sense that certain cultural elements in fact, off the favela have become like uh, main tourist attractions of, of, of Brazil and of Rio de Janeiro, things associated in, in the image. But more, in more practical terms, the beginning of tourists actually asking and wanting to visit favelas goes back to 1992, when um, the, the Earth Summit, a massive con international conference, took place in Rio de Janeiro, and about 20,000 people, NGOs, government workers, social movements, gathered to discuss the future of the planet, sustainability, poverty. And now many of these delegates were actually quite intrigued. Um, the Brazilian government at the time um, had a very repressive grip on the favelas. The, through invisibility, through neglect of the years, favelas had developed into perceived really dangerous places, places as well, where in the absence of the state, other structures gangs had, had arisen, other you know, sides of the economy had arisen, drug trade. And, um, and they were considered outright dangerous, and they were dangerous. Um, so this international summit coming up, the government decided to close the favelas off to have 
army positioned in front of the entrances of them. And again, think of the map. We are very close. We have Ipanema, Copacabana there in the south zone. Very important, very famous places with all the top hotels. Right next to it are these favelas, places that are not only not on the map, but as these international tourists who stay in these five star uh, tourists and conference tourists who stay in these five star hotels go by uh, the entrances where they have army in front of it, people are starting to ask questions. What is behind this? What is going on there? We're here to discuss sustainability, we're here to discuss you know, poverty and so forth. And what's going on behind this, uh, these walls? They are, in fact, sometimes walls, but uh, they were in that you know, police presence and, um, and, and so forth. So the, 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 the tourists, in that instance, these, these visitors, these conference visitors, uh, wanted to see behind the police lines. They wanted to see what's going on in the favela. And tourism operators were quite quick to react to that demand and started to, you know, through contacts or through, um, through discussions, uh, to, to offer tools. And from 92, it has developed into like a, like a very frequent um, phenomenon of a very regular phenomenon, like a must-do in Rio de Janeiro. Nowadays, when a tourist comes to an international tourist comes to uh, Rio de Janeiro, um, he or she uh, will very likely be uh, doing a tour of a favela. Um, why do tourists like to go there? Now, I, I always, uh, I always like to to not spend too much time on this because we never quite know why people do things, right? I mean, we don't even know why we do things. So, like. It's very hard, this whole motivation discussion. How do you actually find out what people want? But there are some broad categories that are, that are fairly, you know, solidly confirmed as motivations. There's this idea that, of course, the contrast, the curiosity of the tourist, like to see something else. Um, also, there is the motivation, of course, of like, you know, justice, of like having in mind, this is something going on here, the local value regime, which doesn't seem fair. So why is this the place, you know? I want to, I want to see this, this other place. There's other aspects that are created along the line as, as uh, destinations like the favela develops. Of course, favelas are also comparatively cheaper places to live. So just like the migrants who come into the city and find this place comparatively cheap and, and therefore accessible for them, um, tourists are also sometimes in, enticed to you know, say, oh, I mean, I can't really afford a, an apartment in uh, Copacabana because it's just too expensive. But uh, what about this place? And is they not sharing the value regime? Is they're kind of ignorant towards the local value regime? They um, they go and uh, might uh, might you know get a get a place there or open a bed and breakfast, which actually happened in, uh, a lot in the favelas as well. So you have this this component there. There's other there's several other factors. People are coming in um, to study, you know, and this is a really important aspect of international tourism. Of course, people are going to other places to study them. And the favelas are, are, are a place that are also particular ones in, in, in Rio de Janeiro, also very broadly studied. So these people often tend to stay in there and need hospitality and some services and they might engage in tours. So we have all this set of motivations, but they all feed into this, the, the, the increasing valorization of the favela. And over the years, um, um, this, uh, this has only increased. Another aspect I, I haven't mentioned is maybe to some extent quite specific for Rio, is just the beauty of it in the sense that when you, because of the geographical structure, the favelas are on the hilltops, whereas the um, official informal city is on the bottom. So you actually have great views over beaches, you have great views over, uh, over the neighborhoods, something that tourists appreciate. Generally, beauty and aesthetics of urban life are a very important factor. I don't, I don't want, uh, I'll go into it later, but in terms of this creative tourism idea as well, the idea that street life is, is vibrant, that things take place on the street, that they're not um, so structured as in the formal city, that you're not, as it were, behind walls where you don't actually see street life, but life does take place on the street, so it's easier for tourists to actually get involved, to be part of it, to enjoy it. Um, so there we go. We have tourism and we have a local value regime. Here's, by the way, a picture like, where you can see very nicely the view that you get from some of, this is the Favela Vigigal, from where you can look over Ipanema's and Lebron's beaches. Um, um, top high-end destinations on the bottom and, and on top of it sits the favela, the labor, the labor reserve. So in the local value regime, the favela is not valuable. It's considered a no-go zone. It's, it's a place that is, this is dangerous, that is governed by gangs. There's no reason to go there. In fact, all the initial tourists, I forgot to say that, who entered into the favelas were international tourists. 
people who are ignorant to the local value regime, who don't see it. So they disrupt this regime. They come in and, um, and think, oh, these are great places, which leads to some empirical phenomenon that you can actually see across destinations where slum tourism occurs. That is, in the first instance, local elites, people from the former city, tend to be very puzzled, disturbed, and sometimes outright reject this tourist intervention. Particularly a point in India, actually, where up to now people be like almost uh, you know aggressively opposed to the idea that you should go and visit the slums rather than the um, you know official destinations and attractions. Um, but of course, this tension, this critique, this kind of misunderstanding actually feeds into creative tourism. It feeds into the idea because uh, creativity strives with tension, with struggle, with conflict. This is also why it's so important to think of the political element in it, in the sense that um, a lot of people are, have ideas of like supporting um, people who go in there, tourists, international tourists who go in there, have the idea of supporting um, uh, the, 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 the people living in, the residents living in these areas in some way. Um, now what's interesting about Brazil and particularly Rio de Janeiro is that urban policy and state policy to some extent um, have actually started to understand and see the potential of this tourism. So after the initial period of like it's just kind of happening along the lines, mainly driven by private initiative, driven as I said before by the tourist agency to make this place places valuable and interesting, policy has picked up and understood that favela tourism could maybe be used and in a sense um, started to support supported the policy. It looked, uh, for example, in 2010 at a small favela in the south zones called Santa Marta, which over the years had developed into, um, uh, had developed quite a, f uh, a vibrant uh, tourism uh, scene as well. It's a small favela, there's only five, six thousand people uh, live in there. Um, and, um, and the government uh, decided to fund uh, the, 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 the training of locals as tour guides to support the setting up of a tourism company and till today this is, this is fine. It comes um, from the side of policy in Rio de Janeiro with, a, with uh, something else, um, which is very important to consider here. Something where structural and uh, structural factors and agency actually uh, converge and often overlap, and it's not quite as obvious that tourists are really the agency. That's the issue of security. So as tourists entered the favelas, they were still governed by gangs and, um, and, and controlled uh, very important places places where the gangs could retreat, places they spatially controlled, but they also took the role of the state in many uh, ways by solving conflicts, by um, extracting a tax, not really tax, but you know, it's not called tax, I guess, and so gangs do it, um, and, and such, uh, such other things. Um, so, so for the tourists, tourists there, and also for the tour guides who brought them there, there was a need to kind of engage with these structures. Now, the question is, did they improve the security situation there? Well, um, overall, it, all the things that happened in recent years in Rio de Janeiro wouldn't be explainable if we wouldn't consider that also Rio de Janeiro as a city, urban policy has invested a lot of money into the securitization of the favela space. So the gangs were effectively pushed out. Um, well, they're still present, I'll come to this later, but they, uh, they were made invisible. They, uh, police has created a presence in the favelas and um, the security system has broadly improved. So um, that came hand in hand with the tourist valorization of the place, and it, it, of course it plays a really important role. What does this led to in places like Santa Marta and also Vigigal, which as you say in this picture, is, um, is, is actual gentrification. Um, in a sense that first, the neighboring official city houses and streets that are right next to the favela had a, saw a huge increase in their real estate value, and now this process is actually creeping into the favelas themselves. Um, in the run-up to the um, to the big sporting events this year, the World Cup, and then coming in two years, the Olympic Games actually take place only in Rio de Janeiro. Um, there's obviously several structural drivers in this um, that, 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 that to lead to these functions. So we have a valorization process that already is kind of picked up, and it creates new problems. Because with gentrification comes, of course, the danger that poor people are being priced out. Um, so the questions here are then, 
considering this change of policy and this acknowledgement of um, favela tourism as something that can help um, support um, the securitization certainly of the favelas, are they now fully recognized as neighborhoods? And are the residents now fully recognized as citizens? Has there, as it were, taken place a major change in the local value regime in that sense? And in order to address these questions, I'd like to come to the favela complex Olemao. This is a picture of some tourists marveling at the endless sea of houses that is Complex Olemao. It's a favela that actually consists of several favelas. It's a complex of favelas, several of those. Um, according to census, about 70,000 people live there. But people there say it's at least 150,000. There's a whole politics, of course, of numbers in these places. You know, like, um, if there's 70,000, you need so many schools. If you have 150,000, you need so many schools. So people don't really trust the census. They don't really trust the numbers. It goes, it's a, it's a downward spiral because they don't trust the census. When the census people come, they don't tell the truth. So, hence the data is very unreliable. This, uh, what's important about Complex Automata is several things that are important. In this geography of the south zone of Rio de Janeiro, Complex Olimao is a totally different piece of cake. Cup of tea. <laughs> My English is sometimes a bit funny in that way. Um, whereas Complex Olimao is actually um, not in the south zone, but instead in the north zone of Rio de Janeiro, much further up. Um, it's not actually uh, written on this map, unfortunately, but there's Peña, you see Peña maybe next to this island, Galeal, that's where it is. So that's not an area where tourists normally go at all. Like, they come to the airport, the international airport, which is on Galeal, but then they go right to the, to the south zone. Um, that's just for geography. The same is true, though, for, the, for what I said about labor. So people in Complex Alemao will still go to work in the center in the south zone. Um, Complex Alemao was also an extremely violent favela, particularly in the first decade of the 21st century. Um, that is because of its size and it has to do with geographical locations for the road into the route of drugs into the city center, to the market, and, um, and, um, and its, its geography again, it's built over several hills, seven hills. Um, um, to, to understand this, you have to understand a little bit the gang structure. There's, there were uh, three major gangs in um, that are being talked about in, in, in Rio de Janeiro. These, uh, these gangs had not just fights with the police on a regular basis, but also fights amongst each other over control of certain areas. Complex Olimar was one area where this was particularly violent. Um, police operations in those years were also very violent because they, in, the, in the first decade, they tend to enter the favela and punish, try to punish the gangs, but then withdraw again. So it was a kind of it was an intense battleground. Of course, in all this was a normality to live for people. I say that the place remained valuable. People stayed there because it was their access to, to work uh, in the place, but it were really bad uh, conditions and uh, lots of people died. In fact, the United Nations, um, um, I think it was in 2006 or 2007, warned, declared, um, understood uh, Complex Alamal as a low intense uh, civil war area, uh, comparable, and um, de demanded or asked the Brazilian state to, to do something about it, uh, and particularly to, um, to, de to change the policy, the policy strategy. Now, this is what happened then, and again we have to keep in mind there's a broad tendency to securitize the favela, there's a run-up to this big mega global mega event. Um, there's also Brazil, as you know, one of the big countries uh, in a new economic uh, self-consciousness with growth rates that are impressive, with a new um, you know, financial cap capability to act and to move. And um, after several favelas in the south are already what uh, is called pacified, they already had uh, invasion uh, by police and, and, and afterwards installed a permanent police presence. Now also Complex Mao in 2010 is actually invaded. And because of the scale of the favela and the scale of the violence there, the army is actually even used. Um, in 2010. At the same time, and as part of the strategy uh, for Complex Alemal, policy decides to build a cable car to connect the Seven Hills with a suburban train station. Um, the building works actually start as the gangs are still in charge, but with the invasion, um, um, the, the, the gangs are pushed out. 
Um, the, the cable car is an idea that uh, is picked up from Colombia. You may have heard of the city of Medellin, uh, which successfully used a, um, a cable car to improve uh, public transport and connectivity of barrios of poor neighborhoods uh, to the city center there. Um, so the idea was to connect this, the hills of um, Complexa Alema with the cable car system to the urban railway systems to make commuting for people who still had to work, as I said before, who were still going to work in the city center to make their commute more easy, e more easier. And, um, and, of, and it, when building this cable car, just like in Medellin in the original example, there was also a component an idea of touristification. There was an idea that these cable cars would not only encourage the transport of people uh, out of the favela, but also the transport of people into the favela. Um, another aspect of policy, if maybe not so directed by the state, but in a sense of a cultural policy, is a telenovela that came out in 2012-2013 that um, uh, actually t took Complex Alemão, this formerly fairly invisible place, and if you ever heard of it, was only violence, and made it the subject of like a telenovela, which is a, like a soap opera, Brazilian style, very popular across the world, certainly across the Spanish and Portuguese speaking world. And um, Salve Jorge, Salve Jorge uh, 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 was, was shown. It, it, it tells a story, it's, telenovelas are not very uh, political or deep or uh, in any sense. It's, you know, it, it's more like a display of uh, love stories, jealousy, uh, you know, those, those kind of things. But, but other issues are discussed in this particular uh, telenovela. It was a lot about human trafficking. But it was also like a display of favela life in a sense, in a way that had never happened before, not on prime time, not so importantly and it, in, uh, in Brazilian television. So it created a lot of attention uh, uh, for this, this change of character of complex alemão. A note in um, what I find important, this is why I put this picture, the story, or well, the main part of the story is actually an occupying police officer uh, who falls in love with a, a girl in the favela, which uh, I think is, um, from a cultural uh, politics perspective, very interesting. It very much it shows a lot about the understanding of the Brazilian state vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, its population, in particular its favela population, as a as a gendered, as a you know patriarchal relationship, as a strong state that is taking care of um, the weak but uh, beautiful favela. <laughs> so uh, so that's just on the side. Now, what's important about the telenovela as the cable car is that it actually started within, like a t t you know, together of course with the pacification in a, in, a, in, a, in a matter of a couple of years created a massive tourism in Complex Olimar and there's some things that are really remarkable about this tourism. The first thing is it's not international tourism, it's domestic tourism. So the first time that masses of Brazilians are actually visiting the favela, they come for the cable car, they come for the views, they come because they want to see the sides of the telenovela, um, they come because other people tell them that they went and it was great. Um, it, it has developed so much that um, from the statistics of the cable car, um, it says there's about 7,000 uh, visitors per day on a weekend. It drops to about 3,000 on a weekday. It, it, this is on the week and it's like 70% of the overall use and in a week it's about 30% of the overall use of the cable car. It comes with um, also uh, uh, attempted through policy guided tours. Again, this, att this, this attempt was made to build to um, train locals as tour guides. Um, the deliberate development was made of a tourism sort of market area. You see a picture of here, which is uh, at the at one of the stops at the end stop of the cable car. In a sense that before it returns and goes all the way back to the suburban railway station, this place. It was also the picture at the beginning. This place has the best views um, of, of the whole vast, uh, uh, vast uh, uh, favela. Um, and it also um, you know, has sort of attracted us uh, a local market area. If you look at this market, it's quite interesting. There's quite a few local businesses there. They sell food, sell um, um, beers. Um, it, it is uh, quite a carnivalesque uh, situation there on weekends, so lots of people come. It's, uh, quite, it's a meeting place as well bet between uh, domestic tourists from other cities of Brazil, but also from, uh, uh, from Rio de Janeiro, from other neighborhoods with locals who live in that area. Um, it, it's used in those ways. 
Um, so you could say there's a lot of uh, potential there. There's huge. Uh, there's some. There's some really. Uh, there's huge potential. I come to this, but there's a. There's a. There's a, There's an interesting uh, dynamic going on there in the sense that like uh, you know some positive effects are really felt in the sense that people have gained an income from it. There's this element. Um, there are also certain limits um, with the current development of tourism there, and I think and this is mainly to do with uh, with too little attention. Um, to the creative potential of tourism and the agency potential agency of tourists in this. So um, what uh, the current development has made, just um, just, uh, just an observation really, is that people are coming to this market. Often they don't actually even take tour guides. They come to this market, stay there, drink a few beers, have some food, maybe buy a souvenir, and then go back home. There's very little interaction uh, taking place. Uh, beyond the confines of this carnivalesque market space at the end of the line. Um, um, there is a low barrier of entry. This is, now a, this is now a zone where you can still see, it's in early days, you can still see local involvement in the, um, in the, uh, in the provision of hospitality there, but the problem is that it's, uh, it's prone to being taken over by larger corporations. It's open, you know, it's like an open space. You can, it's, a, it's a massive resource, there's no reason uh, at the moment, there's no barrier of, uh, of, of larger tourist corporations to take in. This is true both for the market, where large-scale beer companies are already trying to get in and reorganize the whole market space, but it's also true for the tours. The, the tours that are, there's an, there's an attempt in nucleus, local uh, tour guiding uh, company, um, and yet um, the other tour operators from the other parts, particularly from the south zone, they are more established and they are not, don't have necessarily tour guides from uh, from the area are pushing in because uh, the cable car is quite an attraction. It has to do also, if you think of the cable car aesthetics themselves, the sense of flying over the neighborhood and seeing it from above rather than walking in the streets, um, which is something that really expresses the problematic of this uh, very, uh, very policy-focused approach to tourism development there. Uh, one that doesn't, uh, doesn't take into account the necessity to, uh, uh, or the, the, the importance of uh, um, of tourist and, and, and resident agency in, in building uh, uh, good experiences. There is, as often with policy, it is considered quite successful, it is by all means a, a successful initiative, but now what happens a lot in these kind of large-scale infrastructural projects is you repeat them to death. At the moment there's two further cable cars planned for favelas in Rio de Janeiro, and of course there's a real danger that um, it just fizzles out, you know, how many, um, how many cable cars can you do on, on, on one trip? Um, now, it is important to, uh, to also, again, consider sort of the overall story of Brazil, the overall... But, no, let me make one other point first. I think this development, what is the problem with it is that it follows, um, it follows very much this idea of a top-down development. It's expressed to some extent in the aesthetics of the, of the cable car, it's expressed in the aesthetics of the telenovela, um, um, with, a, with a patronizing state coming in and um, saving the people. It doesn't take into account the importance of a, of a, of a development that comes from below. And, and this feeds into uh, a new situation, an emerging situation, perhaps, hopefully not, in which, as you all are aware, uh, uh, of course, is that the, the economic uh, situation of, of Brazil overall isn't as good as it used to be. There's been a, a severe changes in, the, in the, 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 the sort of terms of growth and the, and the outlook which is reflected in all sorts of aspects and um, not the least of course in people's outlook on, uh, on, on, on future development, jobs, prospects and so forth, um, which feeds into a, a re-emergence of the problem of the gangs in the, in the poor neighborhoods and a kind of fear that is very prevalent in the, in the neighborhoods that the state is not in for real, that, there is a, that they might just get tired that the resources might run out, that, the, that certainly after the big international events there will be a fizzling out of this, this new engagement. Um, and in that situation where you have one patron, which is the state, and the other patron, which is still lingering, which are the gangs, the people don't take chances, they don't buy into this new regime. They kind of, they keep, they keep their options open. You can see this in this graffiti, this is why it's put us up. Um, command, the Commando Vermeo is one of the gangs, CV. It's often sprayed on, it's often the gangs themselves that do this to kind of show there is still loyalty to the gang in the neighborhood despite the police presence. 
And people have started all over, all over Rio, actually, in the past five favelas to paint azul over it, which means blue. And blue is also the color of the uniforms of the occupied police force. So the occupied police force is understood just parallel to the former gangs. And that's, of course, not how a state should be understood or, in fact, act. Um, in that sense, there's a lot of problems, there's a lot of issues, and we'll just focus on tourism here. I think one of the things, and it's really interesting to talk to um, people active in the area, particularly coming from this idea of like, a, a bottom-up growth of tourism, is that one aspect of, of, of helping there is maybe the idea of a more creative tourism, of more uh, bottom-up tourism, of more participation, both by the tourists and the locals in creating and changing over um, um, this neighborhood. How this can be done? Well, it needs, of course, a lot of it needs a lot of energy and a lot of uh, willingness. But um, as I've as I've been there and I, I saw tourists, in the broadest sense, trying to engage in setting up spaces for people to stay longer, for artists, for researchers to kind of create a, a create a new um, create new uh, sort of attractions that are not a tourist market with a sort of a sort of a distant place overlooking the favela, but are more in the street or more next to the people who live there. And, um, and it's about encouraging those kind of images, among other things, of course, to, to also potentially help, help the situation. Um, so I, I would conclude in, on this case study that the city has actually discovered the potential of tourist valorization. It has, um, but it has not uh, fully understood the logic of creative tourism. The policy aims large, looks at mega events and security, but it doesn't really consider still the residents and in fact the tourists as agency in this because it's a, it's, it, it, it's a, it's a fairly top-down uh, understanding of state intervention. So uh, the idea is that uh, there is a potential of creative tourism to make cities agreeable, vibrant places, empowering communities, but it needs democracy to work. So it's very crucial in planning and in, 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 in involvement there of the state to have a more democratic understanding. Um, Otherwise, uh, you'll end up with, um, uh, with new rigidities in the value regime as the local value regime changes and these places become more valued. That the value is immediately entered into new rigid systems of you know, uh, um, uh, real estate uh, um, uh, valuation, which uh, often comes with displacement of residents and a securitization uh, which undermines democracy. And the thing is that the problem is that the gangs are actually on their way back. That security situation is getting worse in some of these favelas, and there's problems even in the south zone and like the bigger favelas there. Now, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm see just we're nearly two o'clock, so let me try to say some things of what I see recently in Johannesburg. Um, what an amazing city! What a great city to live in! Uh, and uh, you'll understand what's meant by spatialized stigma, because of course for the international audience. There's a perception of Johannesburg as an unsafe place, as a dangerous place, as something which you, you know, you, um, you have to be careful all the time, you don't know where to go. Uh, but but in, in terms of like the direct application to say to townships, for example, like in a local value regime, I'm not sure this similar thing applies. I mean, clearly town, townships play a role historically, uh, very similar in the sense that they provide labor um, and that the people living in there and put in there uh, in the apartheid period to live there are not recognized as citizens. In fact, I mean, that was the key, the, 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 the key operation of apartheid. But, um, but of course, apartheid is long ago. So you could think of the just a, uh, a tourist valorization maybe in the past, in the, in the, in the immediate post-apartheid period or even pre-apartheid. And there's been some work on like people visiting the townships, the struggle junkies, the work sometimes called, I guess. But, um, uh, but township valorization, in that sense, today uh, takes a very different form. And over 20 years of township tourism, um, there's also been shifts. What's interesting, of course, is the main focus is, is often political heritage tours. It's focused a little bit on hospitality. And in the case of Soveto, there's a, there's a clear element of adventure tourism. You can jump from those cooling towers, um, uh, bungee jumping there. Um, but is there like this creative tourism, is there this bottom-up involvement? Um, because, of course, political heritage is very much a top-down. It's like, this is a heritage site, this is a heritage site, here should go. Where's the, you know, where's the element of creative tourism? What is the involvement of the community? Is there, is there potential to increase it? And yeah, in, in fact, would it matter? Is it necessary? Is it, is, it, is it anything that is good or that is 
supposed to be happening. Now, what I found, for example, last Sunday, um, thanks uh, mainly through Milena, actually, um, whose son is involved in, um, in setting this up, and, and some other people uh, who've studied here, is a, is a, is a market, low-grade market. Has anybody heard of this? Someone? Maybe been there? It's, uh, it's the idea of like applying this, this um, a little bit applying the concept of the Bramfortain uh, uh, neighbor goods market uh, and, and install it in, uh, in Orlando West. It's right next to Villa Kazi Street, actually, as you can see from the cooling towers in the background there. We're like kind of having sort of similar perspective there. It's not 150 meters away. It's a fantastic little event and it, it displayed a lot of creativity present. A lot of sort of um, you know uh, creative little creative businesses, but also ideas of like you know just bringing people together uh, from Soweto with potentially attracting, of course, people from other parts, tourists in the broadest sense, tourists that are coming from other suburbs, uh, uh, particular uh, richer suburbs, and and of course international tourists as well. Um, it was the first time. It was a great event. It didn't rain. Um, it rained the next day. So. Uh, uh, everybody involved was really, uh, uh, really happy about it, and it had it had a distinct, uh, distinct, uh, attractive feel to it. Um, I think uh, it is initiatives like this it can maybe push, uh, push onwards um, um, and forward um, this kind of creative tourism development in this. Why is it? Why does it matter? Um, because although there is not this spatial stigma attached to the townships anymore, maybe in this, um, in this. Um, radical sense or uh, of apartheid and also in this kind of uh, more uh, less radical but still significant sense of Brazil but uh, but there there is of course uh, issues in the country about bringing people together and like you know uh, knowing about each other's lives as, as is everywhere um, and so I think in that sense uh, these, these kind of uh, these kind of uh, markets can play an important role tourism How's tour how are tourist agents in there? Well, I, uh, me, I'm a professional tourist. I go to various places and do tours all the time. It's my job. Uh, I was there, for example. I mean, <laughs> there's lots of uh, there's lots of other there's lots of other people who who, who might have been to um, to heritage sites in Soweto, but who I don't think have seen Soweto from this side. And in fact, lots of people who live in Soweto haven't seen Soweto necessarily in this way through the lens of uh, on market an event like this. Another thing um, which I think applies more to this notion of disruptive valorization that I was talked about before is actually not in a township as Hilbro, the tour I did in Hilbro, which has a terrible reputation as a place, even within Johannesburg. And, um, and, um, and it's in fact, if you think of the logics, the political economy of invisible labor, um, what I referred to be, be before is uh, very precisely actually an area that is, you could argue, functionally invisible because you don't want that labor power to be visible because it would mean that it has to be more recognized. It would have to have proper housing for this labor force. It would have to have uh, services for this labor uh, force and so forth. So it's a very similar setup there uh, in that case with international migrants, of course, mainly from other African countries. So in a, in a sense here, um, this whole idea of disruptive validation is much more parallel in Hilbro, not in Soweto. To the to the things I described about Brazil and um, and the tools there are just picking up. I can highly recommend it. it takes place I think every Saturday. Um, gives you a good lively view of the neighborhood and it shows you that it's actually a very nice place to live. And again, um, when I spoke to um, the person organizing it, he's pointing out the fact that initially only international tourists had come on this tour, but in the meantime, here's much more uh, South Africans coming as well. It is um, it is a great experience. Um, I leave it there because we're coming to two o'clock, and I hope there's maybe some uh, some space for questions. I, I put some. I put. Let me say that uh, this put some things up for discussion. The first thing is maybe this motor storm tourism that meets the eye. You know, go beyond the moral debate. Look at it as a as a potential to to disrupt rigid value regimes and valorize places with a bad reputation, to lend visibility politically to neglected places. Um, that it actually fosters vibrancy of city life and make life city life more viable, livable for everyone. And that in that sense it benefits the tourist experience as well as the residents. Um, but there is the other side to it. It does create new rigidities, the structural factors uh, play an important role in this. It's not all agency in other words. Um, but uh, but uh, we, have to, uh, we have to keep those at, at bay when we look at these. But, but overall I think um, we, can, uh, we can also maybe see uh, 
particularly in the struggles around gentrification that take place in some places, that there are new frontiers for this disruptive valorization. Um, but uh, yeah, that's another point. Thank you very much for your attention. And, um, and yeah, if you have any questions.